Hey, my name is Eric Lively, and I am blessed to be the Connect Pastor here at Sojo Church. Here at Sojo, we are a community with a cause, and that is to help people discover life, peace, and purpose. And it is our prayer that you receive a blessing from watching this today. So be sure to like, share, and subscribe. God bless. I want to invite you guys into our last sermon, Shine. We're going to have Easter Sunday next week, but uh, there's an author that wrote the habits of highly effective people, and one of those habits is to start with the end in mind. And so I want to let you guys know that I'm starting with the premise that we have an opportunity as we leave this place, as we do begin Holy Week, and Holy Week is the week that Christians lead up to Easter, because during this Holy Week, I believe that people's hearts are open more than ever. And the question that I want to propose is, will we leave this place with purpose? Will we leave this place with purpose? And I love what Rod did. He talked about those 350 lives that are on that cross because every name represents somebody's eternity. And there's way more than 350 people that we'll interact with this week. And the question is, is will we live this week with purpose? And so there's a couple things I'm going to ask you guys to do at the end. Number one, I'm going to ask you to pray. Pray for lives to be changed. Number two, I'm going to ask you to invite. There's a bunch of invite cards on the back, and I want to ask you guys to take every single one of those invite cards so that we have none left, and people are going to spread them out throughout the world like Debbie Tripp did yesterday. For guys who don't know, stand up, Debbie. Debbie handed out like 28 uh, invite cards yesterday. Uh, everywhere she went, she handed one out to, to, to different people, and I just want to say I'm proud of you, Debbie. Way to go. Um, and so here's what I want to start. And last one, this is going to be probably the hardest kind of challenge, but I think all of us can do it. Is, uh, some of us may not know how to do it as much as others. Shoot a selfie video, inviting your friends and your family to Easter at Sojo. Like turn the video around, camera around, say, hi, my name is, my name is, sicka, sicka, sicka. <laughs> let me let me dig in. So we are still traveling through the book of Acts. Sicka, sicka. Sicka, sicka. I love it. I love it. We're we're traveling through the book of Acts, and I want to I want to end with uh, the very. I want to start with the very last verse that we're going to read today, and it's Acts chapter nine, verse thirty one, and it says, "So the church throughout Judea, Galilee, Samaria had peace, and it was strengthened." Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. So those guys who have been here with us all along and those who are new are going through the whole book of Acts. And the first three chapters, we see that the church of Jesus Christ begins. It becomes an infant. It is birthed. We see that four through six, that the church of Jesus Christ has this amazing growth up to 8,000 believers in just a matter of a few weeks we see that Acts chapter 7 through 9, that persecution breaks out, but this persecution is, for lack of a better word, used for a purpose because the gospel needs to spread. And so what was the church in Jerusalem has now become the church in Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. So God allowed and used persecution to push the church out, and it was still growing. Without it being pushed out, never have reached you if it never have reached me so I've got a couple questions they're pretty redundant but for the lack of better words let me ask them for, number one does God want his church to grow okay does God want his church to grow one more time does God want his church to grow does God want his church to shrink who does God want to use to grow his church? Us. You guys are good. How can we go? I'm sorry, let me read this question. How do we get involved? By going and telling. Let me try. I'm going to give you the answer so that we can say it all together. How do we get involved? Going and, going and telling. So that's my challenge today is to go and tell. And so as we read this story, I want you guys to explore this main theme that I have for you throughout this story. As we go out this story, as we read it, I want you to think about these words. Will I trust what he says or will I trust what, he, what I see? Will I trust what he says or will I trust what I see? Will I trust what he says or will I trust what he sees? So Acts chapter 9, verse 1, 
we're reintroduced to a character named Saul. It says, now, Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples and the Lord, and he went to the high priest. He requested letters from the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any men or women who belonged to the way, so the way was the very first call of what Christianity was. So I want you guys to understand that you're being introduced to what they very first called themselves. They don't actually become called Christians until the church at Antioch. We'll come to that in just a few short chapters. But they call them the way. So any men or women who belong to the way, he might bring them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he traveled and he was nearing Damascus, a light from heaven suddenly flashed around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul responds, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, the one that you are persecuting, he replies. But get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. Then men who were traveling with whom stood speechless, hearing the sound but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were opened, he could see nothing. So they took him by the hand and led him into the city of Damascus. He was unable to see for three days. A couple things I want to point out here. The name of Saul is the same guy who killed Stephen in Acts chapter 7. Remember, they laid robes at this man named Saul. You guys affectionately know him more often as Paul because God changes his name in a few chapters. But Saul is the person who killed Stephen. He was trying to eliminate the church. And Jesus calls this man to be his disciple. Jesus calls this man to be a disciple. And i got to think, like, this has got to be the most unlikely of disciples. And I think sometimes I'm the most unlikely of disciples. I remember when I first got saved, my life verse came out of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 28. For God chose the foolish of things, the foolishness of the world, to shame the wise. And I want you to think about this. God is choosing the very instrument that the devil was using to eliminate the church to now be one of his biggest proponents. Yesterday, I was at the car wash, and I saw this guy. He had a big red beard, and I was jealous first off because I want a big, big beard. But then he had a Baphomet on the front of his black sweatshirt. Anybody know what a Baphomet is? It's the picture of the devil goat, the goat devil. And on the back of his sweatshirt, it said, Hail, 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 666. As I pulled up beside him, because I I was in the car wash line, I saw these skulls in his, like, front windshield he had all these like horror movies like all these different figurines of horror movies and two up front he had two skulls and both of them are upside down crosses I would wish I would love to say because I honestly I, I feel like it's better for me to tell the truth I could t- like, tell y'all story I went up to him witnessed to him told him about Jesus and he's coming to the second service right <laughs> but it wasn't until I was going over my notes that I realized I did miss an opportunity And I judged him, and I looked at him, and I thought, this guy would never come to church. And I feel like, as I stand before you, I missed an opportunity. I missed an opportunity to just talk to someone and get to know them, and and who knows what God would have done with it. But he would have been one of the most unlikely characters to invite the church or to talk to about Jesus, but he's still made in the image of God. And I just want to say I I missed an opportunity, and I hope that I don't miss another one this week. Verse 10 says, there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him with a vision, Ananias. He says, here I am, Lord. He says, get up and go to the street called Straight. And I want to let you know, you can Google Damascus right now and Google the street called Straight. And that is still the main trade route 2,000 years later. This straight street is still one of the streets. I'm saying the word too often now. (laughs) 
It's a real street, is all I want to say. The Lord said to him, to the house of Judas. All right, so you're having a dream, and the Lord says, get up. I got a job for you to do. I want you to go to the straight street and go to the house of Judas. Anybody remember what Judas does? So like I all, I mean, I know this is a common name, but I would have been like, uh, Lord, already, I don't know how this story is starting. He says, and go ask for the man from Tarsus named Saul since he's praying there. In a vision, he's seen a man named Ananias coming to him and placing his hands on him so that he may regain his sight. Verse 13, Lord, I, I, I have heard from many people about this man and how much harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has authority here from the chief priest to arrest all that call your name. He's like, uh, Lord, do you really know what you're telling me to do? Verse 15 says, but the Lord said to him, go. For this man is my chosen instrument to take the name to the Gentiles, to kings and to Israelites. I will show him how much he must suffer from my name. So I want you to stop and place yourself in that situation. I already told you, like, I was in this situation yesterday and I failed. Place yourself in this situation and ask yourself, will I trust what I see or will I trust what he says? Will I trust what I see or will I trust what he says? Verse 17, Ananias went. He trusts what he says. He enters the house. He placed his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road you are traveling has sent me so that you may gain, re, regain your sight and to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And at once something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. And then he got up and he was baptized. After taking some food, he regained his strength. First off, I want to talk to you guys about Saul's affliction. Throughout Scripture, we hear about this thing called Paul's thorn. He says that he asked the Lord to remove it over and over and over again, but he is not able to. All throughout Scripture, if you read the beginning of Saul's books, most of his books were written from a dark prison cell. In a dark prison cell, you can't see very well. And so what we think is that because of this occurrence, Paul always struggled with his eyesight forevermore. He was always afflicted because of this one occurrence where he saw the Lord Jesus. And every single time that you see one of Paul's letters, it says at the end that this letter was penned by somebody else. And so I want you to see that even after this occurrence, he still is touched by an affliction. And I want you to think about this. Think about this one thing, that this wasn't one of the apostles who was led to this man. It was just a regular, ordinary guy that was led to Saul, who was living in Damascus. God called out of the blue to go and was sent to this man. That he trusted in what God said to go and tell. And because of his willingness to go, Saul was restored. How many of you guys know Billy Graham? Raise your hands. How many of you guys know who Mordecai Ham is? Mordecai Ham was preaching a revival in L.A. when Billy Graham was 16 years old. I might have got the city wrong. But Billy Graham walked into Mordecai Ham's revival, gave his life to the Lord, and was called to be a revival preacher all because of Mordecai Ham. Nobody knows Mordecai Ham's name, but all of us know who Billy Graham is. Why am I telling you this story? How do you know that the person that God's calling you to go to isn't going to be the one who changes the world? It could be the most unlikely of figures. And so my question that I want to ask all of us is, who is the Lord sending you to? And will I trust what he says or will I trust what I see? Now we continue on in the story, verse 26. It says, when he, being Paul, arrives in Jerusalem, so he was in Damascus, he travels down to Jerusalem, it says that he tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him, since they did not believe that he was a disciple. Barnabas, however, took him 
and brought him to the apostles and explained to them how Saul had seen the Lord on the road and that the Lord had talked to him and how in Damascus he had spoken boldly of the name of Jesus. Saul was coming and going with them in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He conversed and debated with Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the brothers found this out, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. I have a man, his name is Don Davis. Don Davis is a guy who took a shot on me. Don Davis took me on my very first mission trip to Scotland, England, or Scotland and England. And I remember going on this trip, I was going to prayer walk, and I just, like, maybe had become a Christian. I don't really know if I was a real Christian at this point yet. But as I go on this trip, I, I spend this trip going to bars and clubs and getting drunk and cheating on my girlfriend. That's your preacher, okay? Just so we're, we're all aware. And I remember Don Davis coming into my room with his wife one day and, and like saying, like, dude, what are you doing? You can't do this on a mission trip. He called me out. And I remember, like, just being enthralled that he called me out and, like, just felt so sorry for myself and, like, I'd failed God. And I came back to, uh, to America and I started doing drugs again. I started, you know, just doing all the old stuff that I was doing because I felt so ashamed in my heart and my soul. And I remember there was a day, then finally I gave my life to the Lord. I literally cried out to God, gave my life to Jesus. I was radically saved. I never touched another drug again after that day. And I remember going to Don, and as I went to Don, I repented of my sin because I knew that I had failed him very much. And then as soon as I went to Don and repented, he said, hey, I want to take you to lunch. He took me to lunch. He introduced me to this guy named John Abramson. John Abramson was a missionary from South Africa. And then I wound up in South Africa. And then when I came back from South Africa, Don Davis gave me my first church job as a youth pastor. And the reason why I'm telling you this is because Don Davis took a shot on me. Don Davis was willing to risk something in his life, risk his reputation for a young guy like me. And here we see in this picture that the apostles were afraid of Paul. They did not believe that he was radically changed. They did not trust what he was saying. And then we see this guy named Barnabas. And I want to say to you that every single one of us both needs to be a Barnabas and needs a Barnabas. We need somebody who's going to put their hand around us and say, I believe in you. Can I get an amen there? Every one of us needs somebody who will wrap their arms around us and say, I believe in you. And at the same time, every single one of us needs somebody who's going to wrap their arms around us. We need to be a person who is going to wrap our arms around somebody and say, I believe in you. Because at the end of the day, everybody needs somebody to believe in them. Let me say that one more time for the folks in the back. Everybody needs somebody to believe in them. Come on. Everybody needs somebody to believe in them. And we are that somebody. And we know other somebodies who need you to go wrap your arms around them to say, I believe in you. And just as much as they need it, you need it too. And as a church, we should be constantly doing that with the people that we know in this place, even people that we don't know, wrapping our arms around them and being a Barnabas. And not only being a Barnabas in that way, but being people who will take a chance on somebody. The risk is worth the reward. What if Don looked at me after I got drunk and said, go away. I got no time for you. You messed up. You screwed up. Did he not have every right to do that? Every right. But God saw something in me and translated to Don, and he gave me chance after chance. This isn't all the times that I failed at being a youth pastor. All the different times he had deacons coming to me and said, did you see what that youth pastor did? And he said, give him some time. Give him some time. Everybody needs somebody to wrap their arms around and say, I believe in you. The risk is worth the reward. And then we come back to this end verse. So the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and was strengthened. 
I want you to think about this. They were struggling because of this guy named Saul. All this persecution was breaking out, and so they were hunkering down. They were afraid what was going to happen to this. They had been pushed out into no unnamed places, but the gospel was still spreading. And so as this persecution comes to an end, as this guy named Saul is radically saved, can you imagine the stories that are being told in these communities? Oh my gosh, this guy who was after us is now one of us. Can y'all believe that? God used that man who was coming to kill us, and now he's preaching the gospel. And it says because of this story, the church had peace and was strengthened. It says they lived in fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. And because of it, it increased in numbers. Does God want his church to grow? Does God want his church to shrink? Who does he want to use? How do we do it? Even in the least likely of figures. And so here's what I want us to see that the crux of this message is an invitation to trust. That the core of Christianity is this word called trust. Go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. God showed Adam and Eve two trees. One tree was good. One tree was bad. You can eat from every single tree in this garden except for this one tree. What do they do? They stop trusting. They start believing that God doesn't know what's best for them, despite him creating this whole entire place. And so they eat from that one tree, and that sends humanity in a spiral. And then we see Abraham. God says, I'm going to make you as a man of many nations. I'm going to put a child into you. He says, but my wife is old. How can you put a baby inside of her? She's too old. And God says, what? Will you trust what I say or will you trust what you see? And you see this ebb and flow of Abraham trusting and then not trusting. Trusting and then not trusting. The children of Israel, the place in Egypt, they're made into slaves. God redeems them through these miraculous acts. They're led into a desert. All throughout the desert, God's asking the question, will you learn to trust me? You've seen me do all these miracles. You've seen me do all these wonderful things, but my belly hurts, God. I'm hungry and I'm thirsty. And so they trust themselves. All throughout the scripture, God is trying to teach his people, you can trust me. Jesus. He lives this miraculous life. He's this incredible teacher. He goes to the cross. He dies. And then he's resurrected. Our whole faith is based off of the resurrection. Will we trust what he says or will we trust what we see? The core of Christianity is us trusting what God says. Will we trust God or will we trust our own judgment? This church, these people, they trusted. And in this story, we see some people who trusted in what they saw and some people who trusted in what he said. And so the question is, is who are we going to be? Questions that I have, what happens if those men who hear what's happening but don't see what's happening What's happening if they don't take Paul into the city? What happens if Ananias says no to God and never puts his hands on him? What happens if Barnabas looks at Paul and says, hey, get away from me? Does the church continue to spread? Do we have books in the Bible like 1 and 2 Timothy? Do we have Corinthians, Romans, all these different books that he wrote? Does Sojo exist? Does the church in America exist? Now juxtapose that with this. What happens if you don't go? What happens if you and I don't go? What happens if I miss my opportunity with that man yesterday? What if God was priming him for that occurrence yesterday? What testimony did I miss out on? What happens if we don't go? What testimonies are we missing out on? 
whose life does it change? How does that impact eternity? And so today I want to say we got an opportunity. And there are three things I want to ask you guys to do. You ready? You ready? I got five minutes, okay? So I'm, I'm doing good on time. I got five minutes. I want to ask you guys to do three things. Number one, will you pray? I'm going to ask you for the next week to set your clock to 10.02. And I want you to think about this. If every single person that's in this room, every single person that's watching online, every single person in the second service, if we all set our clocks and we begin to pray together in all of our different places, can God do amazing things? Think about that idea that 300 people from one church setting their clocks at 10.02 a.m. for the next seven days and asking God, God, would you do something amazing on Easter? And would you just do something amazing on Easter? Would you do something amazing out? All of our church are going out and we're going and telling people about the gospel and inviting them to church services on Easter Sunday. Can God use that? So would you please go to your clock? You can do it now. Go to your clock and go set the alarm for 10.02 a.m. And let's pray together over these next seven days asking God to do something incredible. And I'm not asking you got to pray for like 10 or 20 or 30 minutes. If, that, if you want to, praise the Lord. But if just a minute while you're at work, that alarm goes off, you just shut your head for 30, 45 seconds and says, God, please, would you please move? Lord, use me. Like, who do you want me to talk to today? Who do you want me to encourage today? Who do you want me to be an example to today? God, help me to live my life on purpose for you. Amen? Amen. Second thing, take. Everybody say take. There's like 2,000 invite cards and, and door hangers out there. My dream is that every single one of those are gone by the second service. And think about this. Every single person lives in a different place. Every single person goes to different places. And think about this, all these different invite cards going to certain people in certain places all across our county and even beyond. What could God do if we're all praying together for each other at 10.02 and God's inspiring us? And as he's inspiring us, we're, we're giving those cards out. And those cards are good reasons just to say, hey, I'm a Christian. I believe in the Lord Jesus and I want you to come. Be my friend. Come experience Easter at my church. And I like, look, listen, we are going to go all out on Easter so that when you bring your friends, bring your folks, they're going to like love it. The kids are going to have a great time. There's going to be a jelly bean bar. So whether you're a kid or an adult, you're going to enjoy it. There's going to be a pet and zoo here. We're going to have a camel and elephants and lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. I might be lying a little bit, okay? I just lied, okay? No lions, no tigers, maybe an elephant. No, I'm just joking. No. But just think about that as we go and we hand out these things. Like, what can God do? If we're all praying together, we're praying for another. And as we're praying, we're acting, we're doing. And then lastly, the most uncomfortable, because nobody likes to see themselves on video. Can I get an amen? amen? But it's one of those powerful platforms we have. You know, Jesus would go to the well because people gathered at the well. Well, people gather on social media. It is our modern day well. Every single person, whether it's TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, whatever age bracket you are, you have a social media platform that you're on. And I just want to ask you, would you please? We're praying together. We're inviting together. Would you simply turn the phone around? If you don't know how to turn the phone around, come up to us after service. We'll show you how. Hit the record button and say, hey, my name is Corey. <laughs> my church is going to have a really cool Easter. And what we're planning here is going to be special. We're going to have communion together. We're going to sing some old hymns. Come on. Some of y'all, we're going to sing some hymns. It's going to be a powerful Sunday. And people's lives will be changed. So will we pray together? Will we invite together? And would you please 
shoot a 30 second video say hey would you come to my church 8 30 10 o'clock and 11 30 amen will we trust what he says or will we trust what we see pray for me like i said i failed yesterday i failed i don't want to fail again this week i don't want y'all to fail i want us to come in this place victorious singing songs because we spent time with Jesus all week long, all Holy Week. We spent time with him. We're asking him to do incredible things. And because we're asking him incredible things, we're expecting incredible things. And then we watch it because we're together in unity. And when God's people operate in unity, God does big things. When we operate in unity, God does big things. Pray, take, shoot. Not peepees, not pew, 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 pew. Father, we love you. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this word together. Strengthen us. Encourage us. Challenge us, God. As we sing this song together, I trust in God. My Savior, the one who never fails, never fails. I sought the Lord. He answered. That's why I trust him. Help us, God, to sing this song together one last time in unity. Because as we sing this song, what we're saying is we're going to go and we're going to tell. We're going to be people with purpose. If that's you, would you stand? Would you clap? Will we give him a hand clap of praise in this place today? And let's sing. Hey, thanks for watching this message. We are so incredibly blessed to have you watch today. If this message touched you in any way and you need to respond, please click the link below.